Hello. I always engender that response. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome uh, to this, the last event of, uh, of the spring quarter at the Institute of Politics. I can tell you that we've had over 600 speakers um, since we began in January of 2013. Not one has sold out as fast as this event. So. <laughs> And, and very few have had the energy of this event. So um, we're, we're really, really excited uh, to welcome uh, Chance here today uh, and his parents who are sitting here in the front row. Not, not the least bit proud, but, uh, but we're all uh, proud of Chance. Everyone in Chicago is proud of him for the incredible impact that he's had in a short period of time, the pride of Jones College Prep. Uh, he's really taken the creative world by storm. Uh, I was uh, reading some stuff before I came over here, and the one that struck me was that Metacritic uh, said of his last mixtapes, uh, by, the, by, the, by, the, by the measure by the measure, uh, the metrics that they use, they're an aggregator of cri criticism. Uh, his work is universally acclaimed. And it struck me because you never hear that term in politics. <laughs> so uh, it really impressed me. Um, I want to introduce uh, Aniri Amin, uh, who is the senior chair of the Institute of Pol Politics uh, Student Advisory Board. And she will uh, introduce uh, our speakers tonight. Uh, she's a fourth year in the college, which means she's a week away from real life. She was the junior chair last year, and she was an intern for the speaker series of the IOP. And she's been deeply, deeply involved uh, from the moment she, well, I guess from the moment we arrived. We, you arrived before we arrived, right? Uh, and we will uh, really, really miss her as she moves on. I uh, tried to encourage her to drop a couple of courses this year so she'd stay an extra year, but um, too expensive. Uh, anyway, uh, without further ado, Aniri Amin. Good evening. Today I am pleased to introduce Chancellor Bennett, known as Chancellor Rapper, at the Institute of Politics. In all my years of being involved at the IOP, I've seen a wide array of speakers. I've seen Republicans and Democrats, diplomats, Nobel Peace winners, senators, congressmen, strategists, and nonprofit leaders. But a speaker who is 23 years old? Now that's definitely a first. While his age is something that we in this room have in common, where many of us differ from him is the fact that probably not many of us can say that they've headlined Pitchfork and Lollapalooza, have been listed in Forbes 30 Under 30 music list, and have made music history by having the first streaming exclusive album to chart in the Billboard. Born and raised in Chicago, Chance's music highlights often overlooked issues in Chicago, such as rampant gun violence. For example, in the song Paranoia, Chance laments about how the media has largely ignored the mass murder of kings, of kids, I'm sorry, from gun violence. His most recent mixtape, Coloring Book, has a sustained theme of activism as the essential key to fight important issues in our city. Chance does not just talk about what's important to him, he acts upon what's important to him. He has been a champion for many issues in the community. For example, with the help of his father and his brother, Chance organized the, Shape, the Save Chicago campaign with the goal of zero gun violence over Memorial Day weekend. Through a Twitter campaign, Chance organized Chicago's youth to march on Chicago's most violent drug corners and occupy them. Chance has also been involved with President Obama's initiative, My Brother's Keeper, dedicated to building ladders of opportunity to, for young men of color. He launched his project, Warmest Winter in partnership with the Empowerment Plan with the goal of giving away 1,000 jackets to Chicago's homeless. 
As a teenager, he benefited from opportunities to explore the arts. He now shares his passion with hundreds more as he hosts free open mic nights for high school students to explore their creative interests and cultivate their interest in arts. Even with his fame, he has stayed committed to what matters to him. He has been committed to free and accessible music from his early days in the Chicago hip hop collective Save Money. He has not forgotten his roots and stayed true to their original goal. It is clear that his success in music rivals his dedication to public service, and it is no surprise that he was recently awarded Chicago's Outstanding Youth of the Year Award by Mayor Emanuel. And there's no better person to moderate today's conversation than Mr. Bakari Kitwana. Mr. Kitwana is a journalist, an activist, and a national thought leader in the area of hip hop activism, youth culture, and young political engagement. He's the editorial director of Rap Sessions, Community Dialogues on Hip Hop, and the author of the best-selling book, The Hip Hop Generation, Young Blacks and the Crisis in African American Culture, which has been adopted as a course book in over 100 universities and colleges. Mr. Kitwana is no stranger to the University of Chicago. In 2007 and 2008, he was the artist and resident at the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture at UChicago. His forthcoming book, Hip Hop Activism in the Obama Era, is set to release in two weeks. So now, please join me in welcoming Mr. Chancellor Bennett and Mr. Bakari Kitwana. <laughs> We might as well shake hands again. <laughs> hey! 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 Thank you. All guys. right. We don't have a lot of time, so we want to <laughs> just kind of jump right in here. Um, it's great to be here again. Um, I want to start, if you can, I think it's important since your parents are here, and even yeah. if they weren't, to just kind of talk about um, their influence on you. Yeah, uh, for sure. Hey, Mom. Hey, Dad. <laughs> uh, yeah, regardless of if they were here or not, I'd probably speak on and could show you their influence on me. Uh, they're just both two very hardworking people. Um, uh, I come from a stable and sturdy and reinforced home. Uh, I've witnessed love from a very early point in my life and uh, support and communal values very early. My pops was block club president and worked at streets and sanitation. My mother owned her own uh, beauty salon. Uh, so I just, I, I think a lot of, most of my values, I would say I got from my parents. And if you can, um, you know, I think the, the, the spirituality in the, the album is, is just so strong. Is there a uh, church home you want to shout out? Yeah. Shout out to Covenant Faith, Church of God, formerly known as uh, Emerald Avenue, Church of God. That's over there on 106th and Union. Oh, I'm sorry, 106th and Halstead. Halstead. Um, yeah, my, my church was, your church is cool too. My church is very raw though. Uh, we, uh, I think all of my, my father's background for the most part, starting back with his grandmother, my great grandmother, um, started this church and started a movement of young people who uh, weren't necessarily, uh, you know, weren't necessarily sinners, but also weren't the conservative. Uh, type of churchgoers and worshiping folks uh, that was, you know, the regular type of folk that were in church at the time. You know what I'm saying? There's, there's always a group of young people in the church or in any group that um, have, you know, just different values or um, are more okay with certain taboos that conservative folks aren't used to. So at a certain point, they separated from the church that they all went to, this group of young folks, 
including my great grandmother. And they started a church called Emerald Avenue Church of God. And uh, my great grandmother uh, started the, the day camp there. It's called Kids of the Kingdom. And uh, my grandmother and my, my great aunt and my cousins and my aunts and my uncles and my best friends <clears throat> all grew up in this, in this church camp. And I would spend my Sundays at church and then I'd spend my summers at church and that built you know, some of my longest friendships and um, a lot of who I am as a person. And that's where I learned that I liked music and I feel like the first girl that I liked went to my church and shit. <laughs> like most of the things I learned in life were in that building. And um, uh, Mike, Mike Hawkins and yeah. you, you Media and that influence. Um, can you talk about that song? Yeah. Uh, so I grew up here and, right, and uh, when I was in high school, I wanted to be a rapper. My cousin had a studio and we would go there from time to time and try and record, but he was doing his own thing. So it wasn't really like a thing to record. Um, and Harold Washington Library downtown opened up a space called U Media which was a, uh, I don't really know how to describe the place. It's just like, a, it was like a building for, with computers and shit and like, they had like pianos and it was just like an open space for kids to come after high school. And you didn't have to have good grades to come in. You didn't have to like do, I don't know. It was just like a free space. And they had a studio in there. And there was a guy named uh, Mike Hawkins who was one of the mentors at the space and he would hold workshops learning how to, you know, use production software and stuff. And he would, you know, go over my raps with me. And he hosted an open mic there called Lyricist Loft. And um, he just, in a lot of ways, raised me as a rap artist. You know what I'm saying? He was a dude that was, you know, really in the open mic community, really a poet, really a rapper, you know, by profession was a rapper and shit. And, um, he passed away two years ago, and um, be after that, a lot of the, the kids, well, we're not kids anymore, but a lot of the people that were a part of the program um, came together to form this new open mic program called Open Mic after Mike Hawkins. So, I mean, he's still very much, you know, on my mind in terms of my day-to-day -day decisions and shit, and I just, did, I didn't think about it. Can I curse? <laughs> College students like it when you curse. <laughs> but, <laughs> so I know a lot of a lot of folks are, are confused <laughs> about save money. They like to imagine it as a rap a, a rap group, a rap clique, a rap crew. Um, and I know that people bring it up with you a lot and are really confused about it. I know a little bit about it because of my godson, Malik, who, yeah. I, who I told you about. So can you just kind of explain to yeah. kind of get people clear about what it is? Yeah, so there's a, a bunch of people that I grew up with that I used to do teenage black Chicago and shit with uh, that, you know what I'm saying, very close growing up and all went to different schools around the city. And we all rap and we all hold each other down. And there's not really, I don't think any like, you know, um, there's nothing really traditional or like constricting about the way it operates. You know what I'm saying? It's not like a, we don't have like a label deal together or like, albums that we make together we just fuck with each other and you know what i'm saying like uh yeah malik is is one of my oldest homies he doesn't rap it's a lot of niggas that don't rap that save money it's not like a you know rap crew and shit so just like <laughs> you know like, like it's not that but uh yeah those are those are some of my best friends vic is about to drop a project soon uh, Joey Perp just dropped the eye drops. Um, Taylor Bennett's working on something. Uh, uh, 
Tokyo's working on something. It's a lot of us, right? It's a lot of people. So, uh, yeah, it's just, I think people get confused because most of the time, believe it or not, rap crews are devised by, 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 uh, by, by labels and they're, uh, they're kind of like, a, 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 like a, let's think of a good word, like a, like a party pack thing, you know, like when you're leaving, like a gift bag, like when you're leaving a party, they're like, what, all your favorite candies? <laughs> Together. <laughs> um, but it's not that, we just all happen to rap. We were all in lunchrooms beating on tables together rapping or like outside of a party rapping and, you know, uh, a lot of us take the shit very seriously, so we're all happen to be doing our thing. How is it that, um, speaking of rap labels, I mean, at the time that you're emerging, um, you have uh, major labels trying to identify a certain type of hip hop artist out of Chicago, and that identity really becoming identified with Chicago. What made you kind of push against that, what was then really had become the norm, and now here you are, become the face of Chicago hip hop, completely not that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking my face, it was like the face I of hip hop. I think so, yeah. <laughs> I'm so funny looking, that's a crazy face for hip hop. Uh, I think it comes from the idea of individuality and doing your thing, you know? Like, I think I'm lucky to be in a generation where we kind of have an understanding of self that, you know, is kind of inherent, you know? I think past generations weren't allowed that and don't have that luxury, but I mean, I think I just am who, who I am and shit. I'm, like, I, I'm not like, I, I'm, the, I'm not like the antithesis of right. you know anyone else. I just I just always did my thing and was lucky enough to be able to do my thing. And I'm trying to think of a good way to put it. Like I understand what you're saying. I understand like there's mm -hmm. a whole another thing. But just to what made you feel that you could do your thing and not feel like you had to fit into this kind of corporate box? Um, my dad, I, I, I remember like there's like, I, have, I always had this stigma because if you ever seen like any movie that, you know, uh, depicts the, the music industry, whether it's from the 60s or the 70s or the 80s or the 90s, there's always like, you know, just a picture of what labels are and uh, understanding that is the proverbial uh, label shark, right? And it's always a nigga that's like, have you guys ever seen the five heartbeats? No? Yeah. Cool. Of course. Robert Townsend, <laughs> check it out. What is the dude named Red? It doesn't matter, fuck it. it it's, there's, <laughs> you guys have seen at least one movie where the band or the artist struggles for that label contract and then they get them they get it and they're like you know I just jagged I tweeted like my like they took everything and I think because of my dad seeing all those films I always had this kind of stigma about what a contract looked like or what signing something without being able to read it looks like and that's a bigger conversation not being able to read contracts but like just the understanding of like I'm I'm giving something up or I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I was just very cautious about it. So I remember I had a label meeting with this woman who I really respect and don't want to paint her as a bad person at all. But a woman named Sylvia Rohn, uh, who was at Sony Music, um, that was like the one deal that I was going to take. I don't really talk about it enough, but there was this deal that I was going to take in 2012 after my first mixtape, which is called 10 Day Dropped. I was getting courted by a lot of, I, yeah, it's very good. And, uh, and but I, I was getting courted by labels, and uh, I remember I went to this meeting. I got flown out to New York, right? And I was I was there, and it was a very very like, uh, what's the word that they use? Like boilerplate meeting, right? It was like it was like the 
there's this video, I'm sorry, I, I always like think of like scenarios and shit, but if you guys ever seen the movie, uh, The Cheetah Girls, there's this scene. <laughs> no, for, for, there's, there's this scene where uh, like all the Cheetah Girls, there's, there's this scene where all the Cheetah Girls go into a meeting uh, at the label and they're like, <laughs> There's like A and R's and they're sitting out in front of them and they're watching them and the Cheetah Girls break out in the song and they start and they're like I don't know they're singing about getting signed to the label and then the label's like we gotta sign them <laughs> and like I mean in real life niggas really do go to label meetings and like yo I'm that nigga I'm, 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 I'm. like start start rapping in a room full of people in suits <laughs> to prove that they need that deal. And it's an ugly thing to think about and even like to, to like look back on it. I had that moment though. I was in a meeting with Sylvia Rohn at LA Reed and they asked me to play some songs on the, on the speaker. And me in my mind, I'm like, man, they haven't heard my songs yet, but they probably had already heard all this shit before. But I'm playing it for them and they're like jamming and they're like, do you dance? And I'm in that bitch like, oh yeah, like <laughs> playing, playing chain smoker, like singing the words louder than the speaker and shit. And, um, because S rap wasn't out yet, so they hadn't heard it, but um, I was hyped on it, and I was like, these people really fuck with me, these people really love me, these people really understand what I'm trying to do, and uh, they were talking about printing up contracts then, and my dad called me, and he was like, you know, I like, didn't call me, like I left the building, and then we got on a phone call at the hotel, like I, while I was in this meeting, my dad called me, and he was just like, Son, I know you're in New York. I know you're doing something really important. But remember, don't sign anything. And I was like, damn, <laughs> is he in this bitch? And moral of the story, I didn't sign that shit. And I left New York and I, I came up with this idea of like, you know, there's a lot of games that they play. And I'm not talking about Sylvia Rohn at this point. I'm talking about who's right. a great person. LA Reed is a great dude too. Um, but there's, there are games that they play, and I remember at a time I had a lawyer who wasn't even really an entertainment lawyer, but I had a lawyer, and the labels would constantly send me deal memos. Um, and the way that lawyers work by the hour when they're sending memos and they're reading over it, they're charging you by the hour. So they kind of put a pressure on you and kind of a, you know, uh, like a, a time that you need to have that shit done by. You need to give us an answer on this deal, figure it out. and. Once I realized that, I was like, okay, here's what we're gonna do. So we, f we fired the lawyer. Because uh, I didn't have no money for dudes. And, uh, and, and we decided that we wouldn't accept any deal memos until the day after the tape dropped. That's what we told everybody. We told all the labels, keep watching us. We're about to do something really dope. We have this project called Asherap coming out. Um, we don't want you to send any deal memos till May 30th. Um, or April 30th is when it dropped. And that kind of created this thing where everybody was like, we wonder what everybody else is gonna offer. And there was this big thing about it. And then the tape dropped. And I still wasn't fucking with them. I just didn't really trust them still. So I was like, we'll hold off a little bit more. Eventually I had to get an entertainment lawyer and some deal memos came through. And I kind of just, in that time, uh, I'm not really speaking about between, you know, having that meeting with Sylvia Roan and, you know, Asherap releasing and uh, doing my own tour later that year in 2013. There were a lot of things getting done without the machine. And what's even cooler than not working with the machine in terms of like, you know, the speed and accuracy in which you get stuff done is also like the machine is very old and has, you know, sharp, uh, rigid cookie cutter you know, technique, you know what I'm saying? It's like, this is what we do. We did it for Christina, we did it for Brittany. Now we're gonna do it for you. And it's like, what if I'm not Christina or Brittany, you know? I might not be. And I kind of just understood we could do, you know, uncouth, unorthodox, very cool shit in a cool way that I thought of or that Pat thought of or that one of my friends thought of and just do it. And that's probably the longest answer you've ever received That's a good answer. For that question. That's a good answer, and I want to I kind of build deeper in there because I think it's important. We're talking about art and activism, and I feel like what you've done in terms of your approach 
to the music at an independent level is a form of activism, particularly for, for artists in the music industry and particularly for black artists in the music industry who have this long uh, history of folks trying to figure out how to get out of this mess from Prince to Chuck D um, right on down the line. So were you thinking about those things also as, you, as you're going through this process? Definitely, definitely. My mom loves Prince. Um, you should always say loves, not loved. My mom still loves Prince. <laughs> and uh, I remember her showing me, she would tell me about the record industry shit and about how he had the slave on his face. And right. like, I'm remembering it in such a, like, I'm saying it very like, you know, like that just because I remember hearing about it when I was a really little kid. So it's like an old idea to me, but I always kind of like, Hmm. I don't want to feel, I don't want to seem like I'm like a, I'll put this back here. I don't want to <laughs> seem like I like, like I'm not like a, hmm. I don't, I, I, I do understand what my footing means and what it means to be a free artist and, uh, and you know, in music, um, and I do understand the struggles that came before. I can't necessarily say that like I devised a plan one night in my right. secret lab, and like I was like I'm gonna free all the artists. It was it's something that you know it's something that's like as as I've gone further and further, I've found and picked up tools in every room like to to get past it. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I think. I think I'm, I'm just lucky to be in the space that I'm in with the tools that I have to function as a free artist. Like, the, the, I think even just the streaming thing. Like I have, I, so I released Coloring Book as a, uh, as a mixtape, right? And I get to call it whatever I want to. I can call it a mixtape <laughs> or an album. And there's, there's, there's like these big, really long, like, mad adjectives in them. There's, like, these think pieces on hip-hop blogs about, like, the debate of whether it's an album or a mixtape or if I'm still an independent artist because I uh, worked with Apple on an exclusive or, um, you know, the importance of, of having downloadable content as opposed to just doing streaming and all those debates aren't, weren't happening like that long ago, you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, uh, and I think being able to make music that, that challenges that conversation because like, all right, so the music business is a, is a newer thing, right? Like in all ways. Publishing, in terms of publishing music, isn't that old of an idea. Like niggas being like, I own the publishing on that, like, you guys, I don't know if you guys know anything about music, but I mean, not, not anything about music, <laughs> but anything about how the music industry works or how they break down in, in legal terms, how a record is broken down. So they tell you, you make a song, I write a song and I, and I rap the song, I record the song. So uh, once I release the song, there is what's called a master and a publishing portion of the record. So the master is the recording of it. So if I sign a record deal or a recording deal, I sign away my masters, which means the label owns the recording of that music. Uh, on the publishing side, if I write a record and I sign away my publishing in a publishing deal, they own the composition of work. So the idea of it, you know what I'm saying? So if I play your song on piano that you wrote, I have to pay you publishing money because it comes from that idea. Or if I sing a line from that song, it's from the publishing portion. If I sample the actual record, if I take a piece of that actual recorded music, that's from the master. None of that shit makes any sense, right? That shit didn't make any sense to you? Because yeah. that shit is goofy as hell. <laughs> <laughs> All All 
of these ideas and constraints in terms of, of records and intellectual property and you know the legality of using that music or moving that music is all very new. And music is not. So since a very, very long time ago, there were people that would sit around on the street and they'd play an instrument and anybody that walked past could get that music for free. And at a certain point, somebody said, let me get a hat. And they put money in that bitch. <laughs> that was the beginning of the music industry. And ever since then, music has been trying to catch up with, I'm sorry, music industry has tried to keep up with music because music moves so fast. There's so many people thinking and creating it. Um, and right now, we're in another one of those spaces where the industry is kind of catching up, but there's still that space in between music and music industry. There's like one example of it is like when Napster came around. Niggas was in the offices like this, like, oh my God, Napster, what are we gonna do? And they figured it out. And, um, you know, there's, there's moments like that all the time, but this, this moment in terms of, uh, you know, music being available on platforms like Apple Music and Tidal and SoundCloud and Spotify, the, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a new uh, model that whether you look at it as an advancement of the music or an advancement of the music business, it's, it's, it has its qualities, you know what I'm saying? It has its, its benefits for people that work in this music or work in this music business, you know? Uh, there's a lot of things that I disagree with in terms of how that music is, is, is quantified. I don't know if you guys ever heard about this, but uh, when you put out music on a streaming service, an album, uh, like a full you know, front to back LP, if each song gets uh, 1,000, 1,500 plays, that's the equivalent of one single unit sold. So, Coloring Book is the first to chart at 38,000 equivalent streams because it was streamed 58 million times. <laughs> Which is dope. Dad, I love that you're still always the last person clapping for me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, um, but I st still think that shit is kind of goofy because you know what I'm saying, like a thousand five hundred dog. That's yeah. so many. Yeah. Um, it's a but, jaded. It's just the. It's a constant. Yeah. Capitalist kind of. It's an jaded. evolving thing. But I think there's like there's two sides to it, and they're racing, and they go foot for foot, and sometimes one of them takes two steps. You know what I'm saying? But uh, we're. It's a, it's a growing thing and it's an evolving thing. And I think there was a time when people were like, you know, when cassette tapes came out and people were like, man, the music world is dying. Like, shit is changing. How am I going to fit my record in that tape player? But it's like, no, don't do that shit. <laughs> Just accept it for what it is. I think streaming is going to be, you know, I think having access to all music and all musicians having access to those platforms is the new thing. I was trying to think of a very cool big word to end it with and shit. It's the next thing. So we, we, only, we got a little bit of time left because I know they want to get some audience in. There's a couple other things I want you to speak to in terms of the, in terms of the activism and the art. Um, do you feel that, um, you, you've you've uh, been talking with President Obama about My Brother's Keeper. You've been doing some work with the Robin Hood organization in New York City. You had the um, the coat turned into sleeping bag thing. It's yeah, it's a very big idea. It takes a it's a it's, it's hard it, to it's a big idea. It's a I mean it's just like a, it's hard to like when you talk about it. Is my mic still on? Yeah, you on? Yeah. All right. Uh, 
No, I was just saying when you when you try and describe it, I had a lot of difficulty trying to promote okay. it because it was so many things for one tweet. It's like it's a jacket that turns into a sleeping bag and an over the arm bag and donate to this website so that we could buy them from people. And the coats are made by the homeless and it's for this winter. That's like a lot of words for 140 right. characters. How did that turn out? Oh, it went well. We killed that shit. We got all the money and hella people got coats. So, okay. yeah. Hello? Can I just give a shout out to Malik's dad? Malik's dad, <laughs> he and this bitch. What up? So, in terms of the activism, do you feel that the music is driving the activism, or do you think that the activism is driving the music? Do you think it's a perfect marriage? I mean, I think that when I talk to somebody like Talib, he's like, I'm an artist and I'm an activist, they live in one body. Neither one is more important. But if you, t if you think about Kanye, Kanye is doing the music. And then when he has a moment outside of the music, George Bush doesn't care about black people. <laughs> That's separate. But like, like what, what is it for you? Uh... I like to attack my music as just myself and shit. I don't really be trying to tell too many like narratives and shit about other people. So I'd like to think that my music is me and uh, I think I'm as vocal as I'm supposed to be at times and as physical as I'm supposed to be at times and there is a big So a lot of like thought that goes into like trying to figure out wh whether it's best to be, you know, a, a mouth or a fist. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes your mouth is way more powerful than your fist. And sometimes you just gotta go out and use your fist. But like when you're like, there's there's physical movements and there's very powerful, you know. Um, damn, I don't want to downplay it at all. What's the right way to describe it? Just like. There's just, there's just a time to be outside in the streets and there's a time to be outside in the tweets. That's crazy. <laughs> uh, that shit was so wrong. Um, <laughs> um, no, but I think... <laughs> Thanks, Mom. I, <laughs> I think uh, there's times where, like, you know, just being a, a dude, just like, because, like, I'm only really Chance the Rapper when I come to speak and shit like this, or I, I'm rapping, I guess, at a concert. But usually, I'm just with my friends, or I'm with my daughter and my girlfriend, or my parents. And we see shit, because shit is more visible now, you know? Um, as time goes along, there's more mediums to show uh, what the world really is. That's what, you know, art is, is, uh, you know, it's, it's an example of living, you know. We try and, you know, create art because we can't really create anything else, you know. Uh, When I'm, when I'm, when I look at the news and I see shit happen, it's like, I don't know. It's, I'm at a certain point where I start to, hmm. I just feel like motherfuckers aren't really allowed the chance in the media that, that, that we're presented with to really like, for it to be something. You know what I'm saying? It's hard for me to, to really say this the right way. Like, when, when, a, when a kid gets killed, like, they trend their name and they try and have a battle of like the pictures for the Twitter. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
somebody's gonna post a picture of him at graduation and somebody's gonna post a picture of him in a hoodie. And you have to like figure out in your own mind what they was doing that would cause them to, you know, that would land them in the type of trouble that they ended up in. And like, I've just never seen like a police officer's name trend. You know what I'm saying? I've never seen like, you know, I've never seen, like I know how, how people use media as propaganda or, or, or weaponized media. And I just don't think we have the control yet. I'm talking specifically about minorities and those majorly affected by these things to really, to really, you know, be that, that voice, you know what I'm saying, sometimes? And like, I'm not trying to incite some shit, I'm just like trying to be a hundred, like, the, it's like, what am I, it's like, if I made a song right now called Black Lives Matter, like, come on now, like, that's not as strong as me going outside and like, you know, doing something different, you know? It's just, a, it's, it, we don't have that, that reach like that, you know? And it comes down to who, who's really gonna show up in numbers and who really, you know, is willing to be physical sometimes. Um, and, you know, I think, I think music and our, and, you know, I have a song on the project called Music Is All We Got. And it's all about like, you know, the understanding of like, you know, it's not all we are, but it's all, we, you know, it's, it's, at times it feels like, you know, Negro spirituals and hymns and worship songs is like our biggest, like, you know, that's like, that's, that's, that feels like the shield, but like the sword is there. Like niggas are swords when they're born, you know what I'm saying? And, I don't know. I just don't, I don't want to mislead you to think that I believe it's not important to be, you know, woke when you're writing raps and shit. But like, I think it's just important sometimes to be, you know, a presence. Was that the longest answer? Yes, that was the longest answer. We have a few more minutes, and then I think they want to take some questions from the audience. I just wanted to, um, you have spoken out on what's happening locally in Chicago around the police shootings, wondering if you have something you want to say about the presidential election, since we at the Institute of Politics. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> and so, you know, I feel like I damn near shouldn't. It's like. Yeah, you don't have to. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I don't want to put you on the spot. I just figured I would ask you since we're here. You know? We're here at the Institute of Politics. I mean, don't feel. If you guys have some questions. <laughs> If you guys have some questions and you want to make your way to the uh, mic, let me ask you this though. <laughs> you just went crazy. I'm fucking with you. Did you see that? <laughs> okay. The, 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 we have about 15 minutes and he has to be out the door. So the questions need to be short and to the point. And if you can, if you can do a one minute response, bro. One minute response to begin kind of move through more. I'll try. <laughs> hi, hello. Uh, hi, my name is Trish. What uh, you, I'm just really blessed to be like in your presence today. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like, I'm just gonna get to my question. Um, uh, my, my question is, um, like, with the different covers you have on your mixtapes that you've done, like, and the first one on 10 Day, you're, like, looking up, and, like, in Acid Rap, you're looking, like, straight at people, and in Blessings, you're, like, mm. uh, <laughs> the third coloring book, you're looking, like, down. And I was wondering, like, is that kind of, like, an analogy? Like, did you do that? Did you plan to do that? Like, looking up at the rap game as, like, an 18-year-old? <laughs> <They're>, like... <laughs> Yeah, uh, to a certain degree, it was, I mean, it was planned out for this one. The first, 
album cover was a photo taken by a guy named Nolis, and I, uh, uh, I just had my, my buddy Brandon Bro, uh, yeah, he's a great artist, uh, I had him paint it. And then uh, the second project, I did want something in the same vein, but just a little bit more crisp, and uh, blue is my favorite color, but I wanted to, I remember telling him I kind of wanted to like, infuse it with red a little bit to be a little bit more, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I, I uh, for this last project, I just, I noticed at the last minute when I was making it, I knew that I wanted it to be another animated cover, but I noticed that I wasn't smiling on any of them. And then we talked about, you know, joy and black joy and like, you know, what to express and I thought, you know, my best smile is probably when I'm holding my daughter. So we did a photo of me uh, holding my daughter, and then I had my buddy Brandon animate it. Sorry, I you gotta, uh, go, I you gotta along, go to the next one, yeah, bro. I passed along my project. <laughs> she has it. She'll okay, give it okay, to where you. Okay, where are we? Heart and soul. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, what's up? Um, I also grew up in Chicago, and uh, when I was in high school, a bunch of my friends got involved with the amateur comedy scene in Chicago, and there's this legend that uh, is circulating in that community that <laughs> one random Tuesday night, you got up at the pressure open mic in Rogers Park and did like five minutes of stand-up comedy yeah. for a room of like three people, which yeah. I think is super cool because that's like <laughs> the most ground up approach to comedy. Yeah. So I, my question, I have two questions. First, is that something you're still interested in and pursuing? And second, is there anything that Chance can't do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, th yeah, that's a great question. That is true. I, uh, I started doing improv at, uh, a group improv at, uh, at um, not at the I.O. Where did we go? Thunderdome. It's the Thunderdome. And we went to, uh, we did that a couple of times. We did that a lot of times. And, uh, and then one day, one of my good friends, John McDonald, he's a local Chicago comedian. Uh, he, he brought me through and uh, he got nervous. And he was like, I don't remember any of my shit. And I was like, you should write all new shit. He was like, I can't write new shit in 30 minutes. I said, we'll both write new jokes right now. And if you perform yours, I'll perform mine. And I came up and I did about like 30 something one-liners. And it added up to about seven minutes of comedy. <laughs> and, and it went over really well. And uh, the second question, yes, uh, there is one thing I can't do. And that's fail. Oh! <laughs> So I just have a question about your story when you decided not to sign to a record, to a, like a label. You wound up giving away your second album. So did you ever kind of second guess your decision and think, man, I could, I could have a lot more money if I'd signed to a, to a label? Uh, no. So I think like the truth is like, they frame it to you in a certain way, like you get paid off the label. I never, I, I know like just off of on paper what deal memos I've seen and like versus like how much you gross on a, on a short run tour, you know what I'm saying? Or like, you know what I'm saying? Like how much a merch gross could be on the same night of a, as a release, uh, no way. But definitely, I've definitely thought about, you know, in terms of giving out the projects for free, because that's not something that comes with being independent. I hope everyone knows. Like, you obviously, you can be independent and still sell your music. Um, I do often think I probably could have made some money selling the projects. Um, but I'm cool with it, though. It's cool. I'm not sad. I'm just like, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. I'll appreciate it, so. No, thank you. <laughs> My name is Giovanna, I'm a huge fan of your music. Thank you. um, I just wanted to ask, what do you think the best platform is for young people to get involved and promote social issues? Social media isn't always the best way to promote something that can easily be misconstrued. So I just wanted to hear your take on that. Yeah. Uh, I think, honestly, like the way that my music, everything came up for me, it was a very 
you know, before the internet, like a lot of people, I often talk about like the social media aspect of it, but a lot of it is like really handshakes and like conversational interactions with people that got me the farthest. And not from like a person that represents a larger network of people in like a corporal sense, but like really like meeting somebody in front of, I used to stand in front of the UC at, uh, over at Columbia with mixtapes in hand and pamphlets for my listening party. And I meet people and I try and talk to them for at least four minutes before I told them that I rap and kick it and get good conversation. And then, oh, you listen to rap? That's crazy, here you go. <laughs> so you could be talking to somebody at a bar and then be like, oh shit, you don't like it when gorillas get killed? Here's a pamphlet. <laughs> If you care about animals, if that's not your social issue, then you could say that and something else, but. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, hey, my name is Connor, uh, and this is kind of an anecdote, not really a question, but I'm at the mic now, so whatever. Uh, uh, oh, I, like a while back, back when you dropped the tape, like the new one, Coloring Book, uh, you, retweeted, so you, you shouted somebody's like artwork out, uh, Kiakili, his name is, on like Twitter, Tayhams, whatever. Well, you said it was beauty, and like, I mean, he just wanted to let you know, like he's, my, he's one of my best friends, but like he told me that uh, he really appreciates the fact that you love the artwork, and um, I don't know, I guess for me it's more like, I feel like celebrities like you don't really get to see the gratitude face to face, but like I kind of, you know, I grew up with this kid, like I can't give you his whole life story right now, but. I can't tell you how much it meant to him, so I thought it was a big one. I can see it right now. I do really appreciate you guys' friendship. I think that shit is very dope. Uh, and I know that wasn't a question. Yeah, no, I just want to let you know you appreciate Yeah, no, I've, I've, I, appreciate, I appreciate him appreciating the shit. I appreciate <laughs> the art at hand, and I also appreciate that friend-to-friend -friend interaction. Because like we were just talking about conversational interaction and how much that can mean, like, I remember being at like Commons book reading not that many years ago. Not book reading, his book signing. <laughs> Commons was doing book reading uh, in his voice. Uh, but uh, it was a Common book signing, and I really wanted to give him my mixtape. And my best friend Justin, um, who's not here today, because uh, he couldn't make it, not because he did, not because anything else. He's just not here at the moment. But he, I remember he helped me out in a lot of situations where I was like scared to give people my mixtape. And, you know, I think having that support is what, you know, made me become, you know, a successful person because I'm confident and have that support and shit. Definitely. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nathan. Uh, <laughs> Recently, at my high school in Los Angeles, there's been some uproar about a Snapchat video of a bunch of white kids saying the N-word at a party. Um, there are a lot of implications that come with this, but I wanted, what I want to know are what are your feelings and thoughts toward the social and cultural impact of the N-word in rap and hip-hop music, especially on young and impressionable youth? Uh... So, first off, no, I'm just playing. Uh, no, I, I, think, uh, I think the idea of there being larger social and, and cultural implications of somebody saying the N-word is goofy as hell. <laughs> like, there's no diaspora, or like, you know what I'm saying, like, remnants, of, like, all that shit, that shit is goofy. But. If you are a white person and we were at a party after my show or uh, you know, kicking it in the green room, like, and you come up to me and are so thirsty to say what up my nigga or do some goofy shit like that, I'm going to instantly treat your ass and let you know that I want you to be so uncomfortable because you have to understand by now the implications socially in the room of doing that and if you have the gall to come to me and bring that to my space, I gotta make everybody in the room feel awkward. Instantly, off rip. Yeah. 
So just to, to circle back, it's not that deep. It's not like, like that's not why, that's like everything else that you see in the world in terms of revolutions and um, communal growth from people of color and pride and, and all that stuff, like we, that shit don't have nothing to do with it. We don't care about people saying the N word. That's not like on a big list. But in terms of like, yeah, like person to person interaction, Part of me feels like you're asking me if it's cool if you say the N word. Nah. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, <laughs> not me. No, I'm just joking with you. But I understand what you're asking, and and yeah, there it's not it's not that deep. But don't tweet. <laughs> That's it. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Matt, I'm a first year at the law school, and I have a lot of friends trying to make it in hip hop, and they sometimes ask me for help navigating the world of contracts. It's like 11 pages just for a single sometimes, and they're trying to balance getting paid with making the world better and keeping their integrity. Can you give them any advice? <laughs> uh, so just real quick, did you say it was they were trying to sign a single deal? Is that what you were saying? It's just an example. Yeah, I think, I think it's very, the best way to avoid all of that is to just not sign any contracts, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, like, you can find a lawyer and you can make a contract say whatever you want to say. Um, but the truth is, a lot of these larger companies and even indie companies that most of the time have backing from one of the three major labels, uh, they have, you know, They have rules, they just have old rules. And uh, no matter what you do, I have a lot of friends, all of my friends for the most part make music and a lot of them come to me and they speak to me about deals that they have on the table. And just from literally an everyday learning experience, getting having conversations with people that are unhappy with their deal, uh, I've kind of come to, understanding, uh, come to understand some of the loopholes and the ways that they navigate it and the ways that, that things are worded to, to fuck you over and I try and tell people to steer clear of it. But I think overall, like, I think, I think maybe, maybe there's, there's some literature that's gonna come out at some point maybe. Like somebody who's, you know, you know very smart and like qualified paralegal and shit like is going to say, I want to write a, a book or, or maybe find an even easier medium to present it, but show you the rules of how to navigate the shit. Wendy Day has done this already. Wendy Day? Wendy Day, yes. She's written a book on the Clear music examples, industry. is that? That's right. It's all in there. Yeah. It's all in there. Wendy Day. Thank you. <laughs> and Jabari Asim has written a powerful book on the N-word. So who, <laughs> who can say it, who shouldn't, and why? So check that out, too. <laughs> Hey, um, okay, so my name's Alan Lake. Um, I'm a student from the South Side. Um, I went to Chaz down by Morgan Park. Um, and so my question was about, um, so we've been pushing this um, campaign on Twitter for a hashtag, um, give Jonathan a chance, and I want to know if like your thoughts on it. So it's, um, he was a recent victim of a drive-by. Um, and so I grew up with him, he was a friend of mine. Um, he survived, but he is paralyzed in a wheelchair. Uh, and so I just wanted to know your thoughts on the campaign. Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously, I've, 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 I want to let you know that I've seen Jonathan's hashtag and want to be very clear about that. And understand its importance um and i think it's a part of a larger a larger thing you know what i'm saying um me and my team actually have been talking about how we uh need to shoot a video to send to jonathan just as my schedule stands i wasn't able to visit him in the hospital um but what's sad is that we're not just recording a video for jonathan um 
one, one of my best friends and employees that works with me, uh, his cousin, in that same little one month period as Jonathan was shot and paralyzed. And my dad, uh, one of his coworkers, in that same month and same time and space was shot, lived through it, and was paralyzed. And uh, all of those hit me literally within a, a two week period, you know, in different mediums of, of people coming to me with it. But it's just a very near thing to me, I think, closer to me than it's ever been before. Um, with, you know, the fact that I have a daughter now and I'm sure that I'm gonna live here now. And um, I think there's just a, there's a larger, obviously a larger problem there, but I just think we've, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of talk about, you know, the murders in Chicago and um, not nearly as much talk about just the shootings that happen in Chicago and how those affect people and the people that survive shootings and they're living after that, a lot of them, you know, you don't see so many people outside in wheelchairs like you would in 90s California because a lot of them, you know, the, the way that it's set up, they're, they're in the house on bed rest and a lot of them pass away. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, there's this thing that we do every year. Um, my family, we do the Save Chicago hashtag and we usually coordinate with the Put the Guns Down um, campaign and try and do a major push uh, to, to try and raise awareness and advise people to be safe and um, to be careful. And if they have to, to be a hero, but to be present um, in their minds and, and when, when they're walking through Chicago and just understanding how we work as a community. Um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out some shit for this summer. I'm trying to work on a program with Commissioner Mike Kelly for the Park District for better programming for the kids. I'm trying to figure out some jobs programs as well for people. But I mean, I'm not trying to overlook Jonathan at all. Like, I understand completely. Like, and I and I do plan to. That's my word to 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 meet him and work with him in some way, because um, I understand he's a huge fan. But I think the bigger question that you're asking, I hope, is uh, just about you know where we stand socially. Like, like niggas are like laughing at us around the world and shit. Like, if you have Twitter and you follow like one of the World Star accounts, like. They're posting pictures of like mothers crying and shit from this weekend. Um, we talk about the 41 shootings and and I mean, there's just a lot of work to be done. And I and and one more time, I don't. I'm not trying to skip over Jonathan at all. I think it just made me think about a lot of other stuff. Um, but I'm sorry about your friend. But what what you are doing is the the music. And I think that the music that you've already done is so spiritual and so full of love. And it's what any serious movement needs is spirituality and love. And so we wanna um, thank you for what you've already done. And we are at you, the moment <laughs> where you have to dart out the door. So you guys wanna give a warm applause. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. <laughs> Chance, thank you so much. Please join me in thanking again Chance and Bakari for a great conversation. It's so great to have you with us. We so appreciate the conversation, your contributions to hip hop, to social activism. We want to thank all of you so much for being here tonight. Please, another round of applause also for all the people who helped us this year, all of you for attending events, our events team, our communications team. Best of luck with finals. Have a great summer, and thank you so much for a great evening. <laughs>